You think of me as a vigilante, fine. Ranging is my job. It's not saving the galaxy. It's helping people who have no one else to help them. It's hopeless and pointless and exhausting, and the only thing worse would be giving up. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Positively Trek Book Club. We have a special and rare occasion these days today, a new Star Trek book that we are talking about, a gorgeous new hardcover, Star Trek Picard Firewall by the esteemed David Mack. Uh, I can't handle this episode and all of its awesomeness alone, though. So with me to interview the author himself, David Mack, is... Jesse Gender. Jesse, welcome hey. back. Yay, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I told you I would arrive like uh, like Captain America. <laughs> Call me when you need me and I'll I'll be here. <laughs> awesome. I love it so much. Especially and I mean, we'll get into it. I really wanted to talk with you about this novel in so many ways. And I'm so excited that, of course, with you we get to talk to, as I mentioned, David Mack. David, welcome yeah. back to Positively Trek. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here. Awesome. Like I said, it seems a little bit rare these days with the Star Trek novels and, and the release and stuff. And uh, I, I guess just very briefly starting that out, I, I'm going to express a little frustration mm -hmm. at how few Star Trek novels come out. And I know we'll never get back to where it was you know, a few years ago with a novel a month, especially with the uh, trade paperbacks and the higher price point. But I just do have to say this is such a wonderful oasis in this desert of Star Trek novels lately. Well, hopefully this will not be the last of them. They will be a little bit more regular on the horizon starting about. Uh, it's only going to be a couple of months, I think, until we have Dayton Ward's Pliable Truths. Which I'm very excited May. about. Yeah, and then we're going to have Greg Cox's novel, uh, I think, Lost to Eternity. I believe that comes out in July. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe there's going to be a paperback a compilation of the script for the audio drama No Man's Land. It's not a novelization. That's what I was wondering. It wasn't clear when I right. saw the pronouncement. Not before. a novelization. It is just a print publication of the original scripts uh, for the audio drama. And then I believe there's a couple of other books that are in the pipeline that uh, have been only informally announced. Una McCormick has a Strange New Worlds novel that showed up on mm -hmm. Amazon. I believe it's called Asylum, mm -hmm. and it had a September date. That may get pushed back from what I'm hearing rumors on the inside. That's not official. We don't know yet. Um, maybe she'll hit the deadline and it'll still come out in September, but it might be a little late, so just be prepared for that. But I know that there are books in the pipeline behind that. Uh, which I'm not allowed to mention because they haven't been formally announced, yada, yada, yada. But I know that there are good writers working on fun Star Trek book projects that are coming down the pike for 2025. And when you hear about them, you're going to be excited. I know I am. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, I know everyone just gets thrilled to know just that there are other books in the pipeline. They so are that's huge. They that's are happening. awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll tweet i'll tweet at una and be like una what are you doing get on get on it do it i need the book she knows. now Trust me, she knows. <laughs> oh, she's under I'm enough sure. pressure she doesn't need anybody yelling at her <laughs> no i am i am joking completely because adore una i want give Throw her a little love her way books. say hey yes. heard you're working on a book you know wishing all the best looking forward to seeing you be a bolster her spirits yes yes exactly no absolutely I, adore bolster, don't so <laughs> <laughs> well, we are here today, of course, to talk about one novel in particular, Star Trek Picard Firewall. First of all, I should mention at the top here, the first part of this discussion, we'll try and keep it a little spoiler free and we'll give ample warning. We'll let everybody know. Uh, we don't have an actual alarm, but we'll sound the spoiler alarm or red alarm, we... red alarm. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> so first of all, I'm curious, uh, the origin of the novel, um, where did the idea for a seven backstory novel originate? Well, the whole impetus to write a novel about the Fenris Rangers at all started when I was watching Picard season one back, I believe in 2020. And I can't remember if it was episode 104, absolute candor when, uh, they say it's a Fenris Rangers ship and they blow it up and they're seven of nine. You owe me a ship Picard. Or if it was 105, uh, Stardust City Rag, where we learn more about Seven's backstory uh, and whatever. I think it may have actually been the end of 104. I mm -hmm. saw the end of 104, I think. 
and they're seven and whatever. And I immediately pick up my phone and I email my editor. Keep in mind, this is like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. My editor should not be awake. And I email my editor. I would like to write a Fenris Rangers novel, please. And about 15 minutes later, I get a reply from Margaret Clark saying, you and everybody else. <laughs> she said, however, the producers have said hands off the Fenris Rangers, at least for now. They weren't sure at that time what they were going to do with them, whether or not they were going to play a significant part in the Picard series, whether they might want to do a spinoff, a movie. They, they had discussions, but they ended up not going anywhere. So about two years later, after uh, Coda uh, had come out, and I believe after I'd finished uh, working on my next book after that, which was uh, Harm's Way, which is my original series, Vanguard Crossover, I was talking with my editor and I said, so what do you got? Need anything written? What do you need? And my editor asked me, would you like to write a Seven of Nine novel? I'm like, well, that depends. What kind of Seven of Nine novel? Um, which, of course, is ridiculous. Of course, I'm going to say yes, I'm being offered work. But uh, my editor says, would you be interested in writing the story of how, when, where, and why Seven of Nine becomes a Fenris Ranger? I said, that sounds great. I will jump on that. So that was where it came from. It was simply a, an invitation from the editors. They said, we got the green light from the folks at Secret Hideout. We would like to do this, and we'd like to have you do it. So I said, okay, I'm in. And that was what got the ball rolling. So I went back, and I rewatched the season one episodes that were relevant. And then I pulled all the stuff from scripts and episodes from season two and season three of Picard, any kind of dialogue reference at all to Fenris Rangers, especially by seven. Uh, so I looked into all of that and then I got my hands on the copy of the script for no man's land. And I read through that. And so I, I sort of amassed all this information and from there began working on the story. I remember, yeah, when those episodes in particular came out, there was a bunch of, you know, not obviously the the groundswell of, of support for, you know, a Captain Pike series or the Star Trek legacy thing. But I remember people saying, like, give us a, a mini series about the Fenris Rangers, Seven of Nine's backstory, yada, yada, yada. And uh, it, it kind of warms my heart to know that you were in that chorus as well, but like aching to create that that's pretty cool <laughs> i just I, I saw it and i'm like there's something very cool about this aside from the fact that the name is just kind of badass you mm -hmm. know like reference to the fenris wolf and you got rangers and all of a sudden i'm like all right so you kind of get the sense that these are some sort of weird badasses out on the edge of like you know edge of no man's land out here and they're getting into all kinds of trouble and they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff because that's what rangers do and i'm like okay you know i'm into this so, yeah, yeah, I mean, the moment, the, the moment Seven of Nine, you know, is identified as the Fenris Ranger and just that badass line, you, you owe me a ship, Picard. I'm like, <laughs> in, in, yeah. I'm there. <laughs> so, didn't take much to persuade me. They kind of fall into that same place as the Maquis, where they're like this, uh, ex, like, sort of Federation adjacent group made of, like, ex Federation folks or former Federation citizens, it feels like. But then the show's ultimately not doing as much with them, leaving so much more for the novels to do. That's why I always, it's, I was thinking about that as I was reading the novels. Like, this feels like the modern Star Trek version of the Maquis, where there's, like, little little pieces here. Yeah, there, there are similarities. The Maquis were Federation citizens who were then mm. basically abandoned, left to twist in the wind during a uh, treaty negotiation with the Cardassians, where the Federation ceded a whole bunch of territory to Cardassian control and basically left these colonists high and dry under Cardassian authority. Uh, and effectively, they lost their Federation citizenship because their colonies went from being Federation protectorates to being Cardassian protectorates. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had a whole bunch of former Federation citizens who were pretty ticked off about, you know, a, a treaty that was made without their consent, without their input, uh, suddenly affects their lives this profoundly, strips them of basic citizenship, protections, legal recourse, and leaves them under the control of an authoritarian regime. So they were understandably ticked off. And that's the sort of thing that will start a rebellion, a resistance, Mm -hmm. uh, a maquis uprising the fenris rangers however something different they were not necessarily federation citizens they might be federation citizens they might be citizens of other powers neighboring powers unaligned planets 
what we got in Picard was a, an organization that over decades has become kind of like a bunch of roving gangs of, uh, you know, kind of Robin Hood and his men, but in space. A whole bunch of Robin Hood gangs, each patrolling their own kind of sector of space and doing things their own way. And as they said, you know, I believe in No Man's Land, by that point, the Fenris Rangers have no central command. They have no official uniform. There's no hierarchy left. They're just sort of coasting on the name and the reputation by that point. But what I decided to do is I was coming in, and since I'm doing an origin story, and the most logical point at which to make that happen was about 20 years before Picard, I realized the Fenris Rangers could have been a very different organization at the time Seven joins. She might have joined them just as things are beginning to go to hell. The organization has only just recently lost its actual legitimacy, its it's sort of charter with several worlds that gave it its legal authority. So now it's just sort of left out there. You know, it's, it, it is what it was, but now it doesn't really answer to anybody. And it's trying to carry on business as usual, but the wheels are starting to come off. The budget is getting frayed. The place is starting to fall apart. People don't really know who's in charge. Discipline is beginning to sort of crumble. You're beginning to see, you know, this is an organization that is eventually just going to be like the Roman Empire. It's going to come down eventually, and someday all that's going to be left is the name. But that's not this day. This day, there's still a bit of organization. There's still a bit of pride. There's still the official Fenris Rangers jacket. You know, there's still some sense of you know leadership. Sure, unity. There's a yeah. sense of mission. Mm -hmm. uh, they've maybe lost a little bit of their sense of pride, but seven kind of gives it back to them mm -hmm. what i uh kind of something something you said there that i found fascinating without getting too spoilery but it is present in the beginning of the novel is how much of a lot of the impetus for this story comes out of just like the budget not just with the fenris rangers but with our villain character as well as it reminded me a lot of um kind of star wars andor with the aldani heist and just like how much of it's just like how much how much of this is just trying to get enough money to be able to keep doing things is just a major like through line throughout the whole book, which I found to be fascinating, especially in a Star Trek novel. It's funny. The second person I've heard compare the book to Andor. Mm. And although that wasn't a conscious intent on my part when I was writing it, I did love the Andor series. And I thought it was one of the best things Same that here. the Star Wars franchise yeah. has done in its sort of TV format. Uh, so I'm very flattered that anybody would compare my book to and or in a favorable way so yeah i think i mean maybe maybe there was a an unconscious influence maybe i took the parts of that that i liked and simply transplanted them yeah no i i, I found that it's just one of those things like tony gilroy was talking about with Andor. it's just like oh i just wanted to be the interest in like how they balance the budget and he compared it to like uh stalin and lenin and like the russian revolution as well so i was just th i was thinking about that as i was reading this book it's just the same thing where it's just so much of this is just so many different groups just being like how are we going to be able to pay to be able to get enough resources for the next just the next day or to get re the things that we need how do we keep mm -hmm. our ships flying where do we get fuel we keep losing ships how do we buy more well they've, they've got our shipment of 20 new starfighters but they won't give them to us because we didn't pay them for the last batch mm -hmm. they, these things aren't free they don't grow on trees sooner or later somebody somewhere has to pay for something there's got to be some measure somewhere where somebody goes and what's in it for me another thing just speaking of star wars and and i also loved andor so much definitely see those parallels there i had another thought while i was reading this as well and you kind of are able to do something in this novel that we don't see a lot of in star trek and that's show us federation or, or star trek worlds not necessarily federation worlds mm -hmm. that are populated by just a whole bunch of different species all kind of living together in star trek it always seems to be very segregated by planet with the exception of maybe earth sometimes but even earth is very human heavy except for the starfleet yeah yeah you see exactly. like more vulcans you'll catch the occasional rigelian or endorian walking around on earth but yeah it's very much uh it's humans home i mean so you'd expect that just like you go to Vulcan, you expect to mostly see Vulcans, but there's going to be humans about. You'll see an Andorian tourist or something. Uh, but yeah, I had this sort of notion of out on the fringes of Federation space. Like maybe when you're just outside and now you're in unaligned space. You're in, you know, territories that are just their own star system and they don't really answer to anybody. 
I had this image of you know Blade Runner style cities where alien members of different species come together and just live in these polyglot societies. And I guess part of that is that you know I've lived in New York City now for 36, coming up on 37 years. So I have a very urban mindset. I am used to the notion of individuals of very different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, different beliefs, uh, different cuisine styles, all living piled on top of each other and somehow making it work and learning to get along and share the space. And occasionally you drive each other a little crazy, but for the most part, people learn how to respect their neighbor's space. They learn how to get along. They learn how to navigate social interactions with people who are not like them without basically infuriating them. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like if it's possible for humans to do it amongst ourselves, it, maybe it's possible for a variety of alien species, members of different species to come together and, you know, live in some sort of huge futurist, futuristic city. It reminds me kind of what, uh, jumping off of that, I was listening to a podcast, uh, the Women at War podcast, and they were talking about um, Empire in Star Trek and sort of like how the Federation still, while it has a lot of these ideas of egalitarianism and, and trying to be uh, very, like, we're welcoming society, they still, by the very nature of them being just a large presence um kind of force people that are around them even if they're not even if they're not directly under federation control to have to be influenced by the federation and trade with the federation or be reliant on the federation and you kind of bring that in here where it's kind of an inciting prior to the start of the novel uh in the backstory like one of the inciting incidents of why the fenris rangers are so necessary and yet are viewed as vigilantes is just the destabilization of the region when the federations are sort of pulled out and left to go help with the Romulan supernova. So I was curious, like, your thinking on on how to, you were building that sort of political backdrop for this. Well, that was one of the things I talked about early on with my editor and also with Kirsten Beyer, who, in addition to being a co-creator of the TV series Star Trek Picard, uh, acts as the liaison between Secret Hideout, the entity that produces Star Trek on TV, and Simon and & Schuster, uh, the entity that produces Star Trek books. And I believe she also acts in this capacity uh, with the comic book uh, folks over at IDW uh, and elsewhere. So we were just you know, talking about you know, what were going to be the, the factors that were going to drive the Fenris Rangers, drive the villain. How did we want to incorporate the Romulan story? Because we have to address it based on the time period and when things started to happen on Romulus. They were going to be there. So we decided to, rather than just, you know, paper over it or ignore it, we decided to fold it into the story to make it part of what the narrative is about. Yeah, we talked about the fact that, you know, there are all these NGOs, non-governmental organizations, which very often have influx of funding that comes from a national source, like, say, the United States or the United Federation of Planets, but the organization itself is not an official organization of that government. It's a privately run non-profit sort of a thing, and it takes the funding it gets, and it goes places, and it tries to do good things and help people. The thing is, when you leave a lot of your charitable work to NGOs, and you don't actually do most of it yourself hands-on, if something happens and those NGOs have to get pulled out, there's very little to take their place. And if a culture, a society, a city, a planet has become dependent on the support they get from those NGOs, and one morning they wake up and the NGOs have all left because they all had to go to Romulus, now you're screwed. What if that NGO was the source of your medicine? What if they were the ones who had all the industrial replicators and you needed them to fabricate stuff and keep your cities running? What if, you know, they were the ones who had the, the, the portable fusion generators that actually powered your settlements? What if they were the ones who provided your clean water? Uh, suddenly, they're gone, and you're screwed. And you don't have ships, so you're not going anywhere. At least not quickly. So uh, we basically talked about the fact that although the Federation, especially the core worlds, are very well supplied... They're very well financed. They're well established. They've been around for centuries. They've got their stuff mostly worked out. And that's great for them. But not everybody lives that way. Not everybody has that privilege. Some people who are maybe, let's say, not fully in the Federation, haven't qualified, or maybe they're in politically unstable regions 
And so they can't get in even if they'd want to. They don't have the luxury of this cashless uh, economy uh, of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Abundance. They have this, you know, an economy of abundance. It's not an economy of scarcity. These plants still operate on economy of scarcity. That is, they're using a scarcity model, uh, which is what we all currently live on today because energy is finite. Resources are finite. Water is finite. And at some point, conflict arises over who has the right to it, who controls it, who gets to decide who gets it, et cetera, et cetera. So on worlds where they don't have that luxury of saying it's all going to be okay because we have antimatter power generation and we have replicators and this and that, the ones that don't have that, they're like, and, you know, we'd love to, you know, help out the people on the street, but we're starving ourselves. What are we supposed to do? You know, we'd love to help these people, but we can't, we don't have enough power to turn on the lights. What do you want us to do? And you leave these people in the lurch, a couple of things are going to happen. They're either going to turn to bad actors to bail them out, or they're going to become victims of bad actors who are working with somebody else, or they're just going to fall apart, or they're going to become bad actors themselves. So we basically talked a lot about, you know, what is it like for the Federation when, you know, so it's, it's great to have utopia, but if you live next door to utopia and you don't have a key and you can't get in, what's life like then? And what happens if you're relying on utopia to help bail you out? And one day utopia says, yeah, somebody needs more than you. So um, good luck. And they're gone. What happens? And so we, uh, we talked about the idea of a vacuum, not just of power, but of goodwill, a vacuum of authority, uh, of information, where there's just suddenly this dead zone where nobody knows who's in charge. Nobody knows uh, who's doing what. Uh, nobody knows who to turn to. Nobody knows who's going to fix anything. And this is where the Fenris Rangers come in. They're the ones who are struggling to hold the Kiris sector in particular together at a moment where all the resources that were holding it together had vanished and governments collapsed. And once those governments collapsed, those were the governments with whom the Rangers had legal agreements that made them the legal interstellar patrol, you know, fugitive capture, shipping control, whatever, all their authority to do all these various functions came from having agreements with all the governments on these star systems in the Kiris sector. And as those governments fall apart, well, you still have the Fenris Rangers, but they don't answer to anyone anymore. And so you have a vacuum and it creates confusion. It creates questions of who has jurisdiction. Can you help somebody? Well, Starfleet would love to help, but unfortunately they've got these very strict rules of engagement as Captain Solak has to explain to Seven. The problem is jurisdictional. You as a Fenris Ranger don't have the authority to speak for the people of, let's say, the planet Soroya 4. You are not their elected representative. You're not their elected leader. You are not their government. I cannot accept your word that I have to respond to a planetary distress call because it's not your planet. Because it's not your planet, you can't authorize me to come in. If you can't authorize me to come in, I can't go in there because that's not Federation territory. I don't have jurisdiction there. I can't go there unless there's a legally recognized governmental entity that's saying, yes, please come help us. Pen pals aside, it's not as easy as Sarjanka sends out a message and asks Data for help, and Picard's heart melts, and so he has to go save the little girl. <laughs> Technically, no. If the legal, If there's no legal government authorizing you to come into their territory you're not going to go there and so this is the problem that has spread and this is where the Fenris Rangers come in they say well we're not going to wait on technicalities paperwork contracts treaties that's all nice high and mighty highfalutin talk but guess what every day you're waiting on someone to negotiate a new treaty or someone to set up a new government people are dying they're dying of thirst they're dying of hunger. They're being killed in genocidal acts by warlords. And nobody's doing a damn thing about it. Well, we're going to do something about it. And if you don't like it, too bad. We're here. You're not. You want to get involved? Come on in. Until then, go to hell. We're going to get to work. 
and that's why I like the Fender Strangers a lot, <laughs> especially as you, hit them. <laughs> they're bad, as you hit them. They're like, you, we're not yeah. waiting, we're getting involved. Exactly. Well, I, I think that's done a really good job of kind of setting up the world that we're coming into or the, the universe that we're coming into with this book. So I'm going to go ahead and just say uh, spoiler alert here for the actual yeah, story. Be spoilers. Of... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think what you see there is the beginning of the world that we're going to live in as of the Picard series. The deterioration starts around 2380, 2381. That's when the whole Romulan crisis begins. That's when the shift of resources starts. Uh, this exacerbates a lot of the xenophobia that's going on on Earth, particularly towards the Borg, uh, after they got their asses handed to them in 2373, which is first contact. And, you know, 2378, Seven comes back with Voyager, expecting to be welcomed with open arms, and she finds a culture that hates the Borg and fears the Borg and is not willing to, you know, won't welcome her at all. And so she's not welcome. She's persona non grata on Earth. And then the whole situation with Romulus begins, and now resources are spread thin, and this just begins to exacerbate that sense of growing desire for isolationism within the Federation. It's the sort of thing that gives rise to, uh, as we saw in Picard, you know, when the disaster happens on Mars, and the synths are blamed for it, and suddenly they're willing to just Passed this draconian anti-artificial uh, intelligence law, uh, you know, banning synthetic intelligence. That's like, wh wh how do you reconcile that with Federation values? Mm -hmm. It's like, where did this reactionary, protectionist, isolationist, xenophobic crap come from? Well, it's been building for a while. It was the Borg Since the Dominion War of the Borg. Yeah. Stretch resources, and then Mars was just the final you know, straw, where somebody clearly, it seems like the Tal Shiar, were clearly looking to minimize the Federation's impact on local space. They're like, we've got to make these people pull inward and get them out of our face. So I'm pretty sure that was the Tal Shiar who did that on Mars. But we see the beginnings. That's the world that's coming. We know that that's what's 20 years in the future mm -hmm. for, you know, for Seven and everybody else. This is when the groundwork for that really starts to fall into place and we start to see the dominoes begin to topple. And that's and that's where I really liked you setting uh, this novel up, especially for Seven of Nine. Um, and one of the things, too, that I wanted to talk to you about because you had it very clearly at the beginning of the novel was, you know, Seven of Nine has been ostracized within the Federation as an ex-Borg. And it was something, too, that I really loved in Star Trek Picard Season 1 with Jonathan Del Arco. Uh, and Hugh and the XBs on the uh, the artifact, where it was this this very clear um, like utilization of the X Borg for a queer metaphor, not necessarily just necessarily as a sexuality metaphor, but just people who are shoved aside in our society based on just something that they can't control and and stigmatization towards them. And then you literally linked it with uh, Seven and Nine in this novel in a sequence that I really loved with her going to a queer club and sort of like finding herself on these like weird like small uh, like uh, communities, both in the like queer club, but also in the uh, communities that she finds, like the labor communities that she's in. Uh, so I'm I'm curious, like your thinking in terms of like linking all those things together, uh, and obviously setting up sort of the bisexuality that we see Seven showcasing in uh, in Picard proper as well. Well, as you point out, it was obviously a very deliberate choice. It's not like I did it by accident. Mm -hmm. uh, Picard, the series established around the end of season one, clearly that Seven was not only bisexual, but that by that point in her life, she was very comfortable with her bisexuality. She was you know, able to be out. She was a far more emotional individual she had lost a lot of that stilted sort of almost robotic quality that she had when we first met her on voyager all of that was gone we we met a very different incarnation of seven 20 years down the line so i said okay it seems to me like what i'm tackling here is a story of the this period of transition this liminal period in seven's life when she goes from being the woman we saw in voyager who was very uh, stilted, very closed off, uh, closed off from her own emotions, from her sense of empathy for other people, just sort of beginning to awaken to it. And she's also been re-socialized into humanity in this very cis-heteronormative environment on Voyager. And so she hasn't really had much of a chance to figure out for herself who she is. Everything she's learned about who she is has been in the context of her Voyager shipmates and their relationships with her and their expectations of her 
And so she's trying to live up to those expectations that have been projected onto her because she doesn't have anything else at that point. But then when she gets to Earth and she's been promised, you know, Earth is a paradise and everybody gets along and everybody is welcome and this and that. And won't it be wonderful? And she gets there and her Aunt Irene flinches when she hugs her because she's got Borg implants and they're cold when they touch her face. And Aunt Irene won't call her Seven of Nine because, you know, and suddenly you got Aunt Irene dead naming her and calling her Annika Hansen, no matter how many times she tries to explain this. My name is Seven of Nine. And Aunt Irene just won't, just can't get her brain around it, won't accept it, won't respect it. And then, you know, one day, she, you know, Seven wakes up and she's living outside of Cape Town, South Africa, and someone has painted Die Borg Bitch on the front of her house. And the local cops aren't exactly all that interested in investigating, and they seem maybe to not care. And this is the point where she realizes, I can't live here. I am never going to be welcome here. I am never going to be my best self here. I can't be the best version of myself living somewhere I know I'm hated, where everybody seems to have, you know, not just hidden hostility toward me, but now naked open hostility toward me. And the authorities show no damn interest in protecting me at all. I got to get the hell out of this place. Mm. And she's learned, you know, I could take any one of them in a fight, but you don't win against an angry mob. She's learned to be afraid. She's learned, you know, you got to be careful when you leave the house. You got to cover the things that make you visibly different if you can. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise people get scared and as they said in Mission uh, in Men in Black, you know, you know, people are smart. No, a person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, violent animals. But yeah. She goes out and as you said she she goes out to find her existence and I realized once I sort of figured out the shape of the story that what I was writing was a buildings wrong, a coming of age story. And for seven, it's not just a coming of age story in terms of uh, her values aligning with those of the Fenris Rangers. It's also a queer coming of age story in that I feel like for many adults, many, uh, many folks, they didn't really have a chance to figure out who they really were until you get out in the world on your own, separate from your parents. And it's only then when you get to be alone with yourself that you really have that opportunity to say, who am I really? What is it I really want? What am I actually attracted to? Uh, who do I want to be? What do I believe in? You don't even have a chance to ask yourself these questions sometimes until you've got the space to think, which is what she needs. So she's got to leave home. Really, it's a story about Seven leaving home, finding herself, and at first, she just, you know, is sort of barely uh, living beyond self-harm. She's She finds a job that feels like working in a Borg cube. She's having these one-night stands where she's trying to find connection, but all she's finding is isolation, uh, alienation, ennui. You know, she, she's not connecting with people. She realizes at some point that people are using her, and she didn't even realize she was getting used. And so she sort of has to go through this whole hard learning process because her childhood was taken away from her. Her adolescence got taken away from her. Her young adulthood got taken away from her all by the board. And so she's starting over. She's 32 years old, but she might as well be 17 or 15 and leaving home and you know going out alone into the galaxy for all the socialization she's had. And she's got to figure this out. She's going out into a community where she, she doesn't know how to flirt. <laughs> she mm -hmm. it's for her it's like everybody's speaking a language that nobody ever taught her and she's trying to figure it out but it's like she's living in an alien culture that she just doesn't get and so it's about her sort of finding her way finding her identity uh and eventually recreating the found family that she really loved which was the one on voyager she doesn't even realize she's doing it until it's done you know, she finds Harper, and so instead of the surrogate mother figure of Janeway, she now finds a surrogate father in Harper. She goes and sort of, you know, finds herself comfortable among the Fenris Rangers, but she doesn't know why. It's like, well, there's the brash, half Cardassian woman who's sort of, you know, curt with everybody. Gee, sound a little like Balana. You've mm -hmm. got your hotshot pilot, uh, Luke and Sagasta, who loves to flirt and talk a good game. Gee, does that sound at all like Tom Paris? And Jalen Parr, the Bajoran Ranger who gets, you know, teamed up with someone else who's kind of, you know, nice and quiet, self-effacing, very competent, very brave, but underrated, 
sound a little like Harry Kim mm-hmm. and so on. And she realizes she, at some point she realizes she has to rebuild the found family. And that's what she finds. She finds the family she needs and it's, they're the ones who take her in at the moment. She needs somebody to take her in. They're the ones who accept her after her first found family just, has scattered to the wind the wind Mm -hmm. and so this is what she finds and you know she recreates that family and something you touched upon there too is i really loved the position of janeway throughout the novel as like the surrogate mother figure who is trying both to be like why aren't you following the path that i had laid out for you that i thought you were always going to follow and and learning to be able to accept seven's own choices on her own terms and still seeing her as as family and, and acknowledging that which i thought was a really uh one of my favorite scenes in the book is when at the end of the uh, near the end of it where she's talking with the uh, I forget who it was the person back at Starfleet who's like well I, we can't accept Seven you know she, you gotta you gotta bring her in or whatever and then oh that's uh, Kima Guy the director of the Federation Security Agency exactly and there's just that back and forth between the two of them where Janeway's like well you I will stand up for my family like just this quick back and forth between the two of them that I found both it was a little bit comical because I could just totally see Janeway having that sort of like yeah the stance but it was also a really wonderful moment of Janeway standing up for Seven regardless of her own um, uh, feelings about Seven's choices, which I thought was really a, a beautiful moment for, for her character. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, that's another classic element of the coming-of-age story. Mm-hmm. You've got the conflict between child and parent, where as you say, you know, Janeway had sort of laid out this vision for what she thought uh, was the best way forward for Seven, what she wanted for Seven, and honestly what she thought seven wanted for herself and that's what Mm -hmm. she was trying to fight for at the beginning of the book she thought that what seven wanted and what was best for her would be for seven to get into starfleet for you know to have a commission uh or failing that to at least go to the academy and get in the hard way and starfleet was just like saying no no you don't understand you've got a discipline problem here she's got a record of violence against your crew she hijacked your ship at least twice We've got records of assaults on officers. And then we've got the whole identity problem where she's identifying with the Borg Collective with her name and she won't take back her Federation citizenship. We can't give her citizenship if she won't take back her name. She's rejecting her Federation ID. Which I found that was a great that was a great point, by the way. I love I mm-hmm. love that like legal like identification concept. That was that was really cool. By contrast, people say, Well, why did Icheb get in when she didn't? Well, first of all, look at his name. Icheb takes back his non-Borg designation. And during his time aboard Voyager, uh, he was a model, model officer and model cadet. He did everything that was asked of him. He disobeyed never. He was insubordinate never. He was an overachiever from the very beginning. He was personable. He was likable. He was amenable. He was flexible. He basically is the model ex-Borg. If anybody is going to be granted dispensation by Starfleet, it's Icheb. Icheb is the guy they're looking for. Seven is a discipline problem. She is exactly what they don't want. She scares the living shit out of them because she's a rebel. She's a rogue. She acts on her own conscience and doesn't really give much of a damn about regulations. Of course they don't want her. But this creates this problem where, you know, but because Seven has been programmed by her relationship with Janeway to think that that's what she wants. It's again, this is also a classic device in storytelling. Uh, The character at the beginning of a story wants something. This is what they want. What they discover over the course of the story is that what they wanted is not actually what they needed. Seven starts the story thinking, you know, what she wants is a place in Starfleet. She wants a commission, a place at the Academy. She wants to be in Starfleet. That's not what she needs. What she discovers she needs is to find a place where she is accepted for who she is, loved for who she is, where she can feel useful, where she can feel like she's living a life where she makes a difference and doesn't have to compromise her morals or her sense of uh, what is right and what is wrong. She wants to be able to act on her conscience in her own sort of time frame and her own idiom. And at that age, at that point in her life, Starfleet is not it. Starfleet doesn't want her. And what she learns when she gets involved with the Fenris Rangers is maybe she doesn't really want Starfleet. Maybe Starfleet wasn't such a great fit. And the more she spent time she spends with the Rangers and she starts to picture her future, 
she sees herself in a Fenris Rangers jacket, you know, out on the frontier with her own ship. And she's thinking, you know, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> Fenris Ranger, lone wolf with my own sort of starfighter, Starfire 500 out here. Yeah, that's a good life. That's a life I could be proud of. And the problem is, is that Janeway looks at this and says, you want to become a vigilante? You want to be part of an organization that doesn't have legitimacy anymore? And this is the, the big problem. It's Seven is trying to explain to her they are not what you think they are. You have been basically given a whole lot of Federation and Starfleet propaganda that discredits the Fenders Rangers, but you don't see any of the good that they're doing. You only see the legal technicalities of how they operate and the lack of paperwork or whatever. That's what you see. What you don't see is the work they actually do on the ground. And Jane was trying to say, yes, you may feel that way now, but this is an organization that's going to become more disjointed over time. This lack of oversight is going to lead to this and this and this. And it just, as you say, it comes to a head finally where Janeway, you know, when Seven says, this is my decision, it's what I'm doing. And uh, Janeway says, well, I just can't condone it. And that's when Seven breaks through to Janeway was saying, I don't need you to condone it. I need you to trust me. And that's when the, the, the switch flips for Janeway and she understands Yes, Seven, I do trust you. You're right. I may not love the Fenris Rangers, but I do trust you. And that's the point where parent and child have now reached equality, where, you know, they can now regard each other both as adults. They're both equals. They may not have arrived at the same conclusion, but they can respect each other's judgment and each other's point of view without having to vilify each other. And they can even, by Seven showing how Starfleet and the Rangers can work together in the story's climax, she sets the stage for future cooperation and rapprochement. And so you, so you have that going on, and then you finally just have the whole notion of just being able to you know, address each other by their first names. Like when Janeway finally says, you can call me Catherine. That's the moment when they are now adults, they are now equals, and they can just be friends. This episode of Positively Trek is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. A special thank you to our Constitution Class supporters, Jim Stoffel, Joyce Mirren, and Paul D. Kinnear. To help out with the podcast, visit patreon.com slash positivelytrek, where, for a small monthly donation, you can get early access to ad-free episodes, shout-outs, exclusive content, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you so much for listening, and live long and prosper. That evolution over the course of this novel and, and her coming to that, that place, the both of them coming to that place, is just one of the most beautiful things in this story. And uh, that kind of shedding the, uh, I guess, the trappings of her old life on Voyager and those expectations and stuff was something that I found really fascinating. And, and when you see Seven in Picard, that's what you start to wonder, right? Like, how do you go from there to there? So many little things that you did in this story, I really appreciate. Like, uh, the, for example, the ditching of the Chakotay relationship, <laughs> which you, it wasn't summarily mocked and dismissed, which this is why I'm not a writer, because I probably would have mocked that relationship and give it in a kick out the airlock. I mean, I had my issues with the relationship, most of the fact that he's the ship's first officer and even though she's not officially a member of Starfleet, she occupies a place in the crew, in the upper echelon of the crew. And him having a relationship with her, given the fact that she's only recently out of assimilation, it just it felt icky to me. It felt like a, a power imbalance existed in their relationship, where he had a lot of power, a lot of agency, and just a lot of experience as an older man. And here he's suddenly embarking on this sexual and romantic relationship with seven who is not yet fully re-socialized i mean she's barely begun to figure out this level of social interaction and he's just trying to move it way too fast i mean in my opinion but yeah like what i figured out was you know aside from everything else i said if we're looking for the reason that they would split an honest reason that would you know preclude them actually being able to go any further forward it's when she comes home and Starfleet says, well, first of all, we can't give you citizenship. Second, no, we're not going to give you a commission. Third, we're not letting you in the academy. You are dangerous. You are a persona non grata. We don't want you on the grounds of Starfleet Command. We don't want you at the academy, yada, yada, yada. At the same time, Chakotay 
gets promoted to captain and put in charge of the protostar project a project so damn secret he can't even tell the name of the project so he can't even say the word protostar he can't tell her the name of the project what does that do to a relationship well it basically builds this reservoir of envy of anger resentment he suddenly the maquis who violently rebelled against the federation and starfleet Suddenly, now he gets a captaincy. He's welcome back with open arms, despite everything he did. Starfleet's golden boy now. <laughs> and, he, and he's golden boy, and he gets handed the freaking protostar. And he gets handed command of a top-secret new project, this very high-profile thing. And she can't go anywhere near it. She's given nothing. She's pariah. That's the sort of thing that will just destroy a relationship, especially if you've got someone like Seven who, again, is still new to coping with human emotions, especially really toxic ones like envy, jealousy, anger, resentment, just the fury of, of being excluded, of facing persecution, you know, uh, obvious racism, and being powerless to do anything about it while watching him get rewarded. As she says, you know, I self-sabotaged that relationship. I was so full of envy. I was so full of anger. I just destroyed it. There was there was no way. I just I couldn't deal with him getting everything and me getting nothing. And I just felt like that was probably a very realistic uh, explanation for what happened to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it fits perfectly and it ties in Prodigy pretty uh, nicely in a nice subtle way, which was kind of fun to to catch. And that plus we had the Dauntless crew. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I was about to say that was even more fun when we got to that point in the series and the novel. And I was like, oh, hey, look, it's my my favorite Tellarite doctor. I was very excited about that. Hey, we know them. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was funny when I when I read at the beginning in the based on things. And, you know, I, I always read through everything and I saw based yeah. on Star Trek Prodigy at the end there. I was like, oh, and then we got to the, you know, mention of Chakotay and the Protostar. I was like, oh, OK, I guess that was it. That's that was cool. it. And then ta-da! and then mm-hmm. imagine my surprise, the Dauntless and Noom and uh tysis and even a little mention of essentia there yep, which yep, was, she like, was there she was there <laughs> of course and then of course there's the fun little easter egg of uh second officer benson mm. named for shauna benson who was one of the writers on Prize oh Year. nice of course was right. yeah. julie uh basically i named a character after julie in my tos vanguard crossover novel harm's way which came out back in i think 22 and uh, you can't name a character after one sister in a writing pair and then not do one <laughs> the other. another sister because this is how sibling rivalries begin and blood spilled <laughs> on the floor. And it's never. There's that resentment, that envy. You, know. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So exactly. Uh, I, I, I created a character for Julie, so I had to make one for Shauna. Uh, you know, Julie got to fly the Enterprise. Shauna gets to pull a phaser and arrest a, a, a Romulan hitman. So you know, it kind of balances out. It's, it's a bad equal. <laughs> it, it's a wash. I'm cur- I'm curious too what your thinking was for the villain uh, of this because again I kind of alluded to this in the spoiler free section but his whole uh, intention really is just to make money he just extort everybody squeeze everybody just so he can make money as fast as possible to buy a warship then he can solidify his power which I thought was a really right. uh, interesting Kogish. place for a character yeah Kogish yeah Kogish the Antican warlord. Yeah, he kind of lies to himself pretty easily. He tells himself that he's doing this so that he can bring stability to the region, so that he can, you know, quell dissent and have, you know, and maintain power and order and, and put an end to all this chaos. No, he's lying to himself. He's just a greedy bastard who loves power, and he's a sadist. He's a freaking monster. He just doesn't want to see himself as a monster. This is a guy who, by this point, has probably killed somewhere in the neighborhood of close to a million people mm-hmm. uh, over the past year or two, you know, in genocidal events, uh, of which, one of which Seven has to see, you know, up close and personal. There, there's nothing noble about his intention. He's petty, he's selfish, he's arrogant, uh, and, and he's, you know, a self-pitying, you know, idiot. Because when things don't go his way, he's like, you three are the reason I can't have nice things. You know, when something goes wrong, oh, it's not my fault. It's Eris Dumardani's fault. You got me into this. You know, it's your fault. You gave me bad intelligence. You promised me this would be him. Yeah, because you didn't screw up at all. Right. And then, of course, you've got the other villain, the other half of this villain pie, uh, Eris Dumardani, also known as Errol Tazgul, uh, who may or may not be a rogue Federation security agency spy master. 
is he actually rogue or is that just their story so that if he gets caught he has you know they have plausible deniability and they can say oh he we're not with him mm. yeah, yeah we had nothing to thing. do with that uh he embezzled the money it's not our fault we didn't do it <laughs> are they telling the truth or are they lying well we may never know there's really no way to be sure all we know is to maintain appearances, they did arrest him, and that son of a bitch is going to jail. It's always an individual's fault, never the system's fault. <laughs> That's right. It's never the system. The system can't possibly be at fault. No. That's no. just crazy talk. <laughs> Especially in a queer story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I found that to be a really uh, just a, I loved I loved that depiction of the villain is just, again, going back to that same sort of like, it's all about the money. It's all about just trying to solidify power, trying to get there first, too, which was a big thing throughout of it. Just like, mm-hmm. oh, we need to be able to get this first before anyone else does or else they'll be able to get the power the fender strangers will be able to solidify their their hold in the region so that's that speaking again to that destabilization of the region you're talking to well i'd like love to talk a little bit about seven of nine's new relationship uh ellery mm. cade this yeah. uh trill fenris ranger that she becomes involved with over the course of the novel first great love of her life yeah <laughs> i love the evolution of that relationship and i was wondering if there was anything that kind of inspired that or kind of informed uh, your depiction of, of them on this journey, I guess. I guess what I was thinking about partly was I knew I wanted to acknowledge that there was a shift in Seven's sexuality between what we saw in Voyager and the person we knew in Picard. And I figured if ever there was going to be a period in her life when this is something she was going to explore it's going to be that moment when she's first out on her own. It's going to be that moment when she's staking a claim to her own life, rebuilding her identity from the ground up and saying to herself, this is who I am. This is what I believe to be true about me. I've got to find my truth and live it. This is going to be part of it. And I didn't want to shy away from it. I didn't want to minimize it. I didn't want to just say, well, obviously that happens at some point after this story, but before Picard, because I felt like, A, that'd be a massive cop out. And B, I felt like it would be an opp- a missed opportunity to tell a beautiful love story, which is also very often a key component in a coming of age story. Coming of age is very, very often contains the first great romance of a character's life. Uh, so I knew I wanted it to be a woman that she would meet. I figured it made the most sense for that woman to be a Fenris Ranger. And so I started to think about the details of it and the personality of it and, uh, in my mind, I was picturing Jessica Henwick, uh, Colleen Wing from the Iron Fist series, uh, among other things. I guess the one thing that I was sort of conscious of as I began to dig into that and I was planning the story at the outline stage was I'm highly cognizant of the fact that I am a cishet middle-aged white guy <laughs> trying to write a story about a woman, seven of nine, who is uh, an icon of both the queer and trans communities. Mm-hmm. Uh having a romance storyline with another woman. And I'm like, there are so many ways I can get this wrong. Let's be really careful about this. So talk to some of my friends who were queer. I, I, I said, you know, what are the mistakes that straight white guys always make when they try to write these stories? What are the pitfalls? And, you know, it's like, they said, well, obviously, you know, bury your gaze, look out for that plot line. Uh, it's always something, you know, th- there's going to be the tragic event in the character's life. And you just say, well, we'll kill off the love interest. Yeah. You know, why is it always the gay love interest that dies? I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. so bury your gaze. Pitfall number one. What's another one? They said, well, this isn't specific to your story, but very often there's a really cool, fun character of color, like a supporting character of some kind. And they tend to be the one who gets blown away in the middle of the book to show the situation is really serious. We hate that. I went, okay, so don't kill the cool, interesting character of color in the middle of the book. What else? And we just sort of went through the checklist of, you know, these are the typical mistakes that straight writers will make while trying to tackle these stories. And the third and most important, which, you know, thankfully I'm self-aware enough that even I was aware of this, the risk of trying to tell a story like this and tainting it with the male gaze. Mm -hmm. so i'm like okay the issue really here is to keep in mind at all times that what i am writing is a love story i am writing a story about these two people these two individuals 
who each have had defective relationships up to this point in their life. And for some reason, when the two of them meet, there's going to be this magical moment of connection that neither can define, but both feel they're going to fall for each other. They're going to love each other very purely, very powerfully. They're going to be there for each other. They're going to defend each other. And most importantly, they're going to still be together at the end of the story. I'm not going to break them up. I'm not going to take away their happiness. And there's going to be no barrier gaze. Now, we know from Picard that the relationship can't last forever. First great love of your life rarely does. Someday, yes. For some reason, at some point, that relationship will end. And it probably ends between 2381 and 86, the framing sequence of the book, because she's clearly not with Ellery anymore by that point. There may be a story in that, but that is not the story I came here to tell. I came here to tell the story of two good people who fall in love. So I'm like, I'm writing a love story. What I'm not writing is erotica. That's not what I'm writing. Because I realized there are certain moments, the first moment they shake hands, that first moment of connection, uh, the first kiss, these are important moments in a love story. But the moments that take place after that, and also to an extent this was true of, let's say, her... Her moment, her one night stand with the Andorian girl she meets in the club. Everything that happens after that and between the emotional aftermath the following morning, that belongs to them. That's their moment. That's their time. That's not for me. I don't get to be there. If I shouldn't have been there in the first place, I shouldn't be writing about it. So that's my thinking was those moments are theirs. That's their private moment. What's important about the moment with the Andorian girl is that we were seeing that Seven is starting to understand the flirting process but she's still mystified by part of it. And the more important part of that story was the emotional aftermath coming to the other side of it and realizing I thought I was going to find a transcendental experience. And what I found was tawdry. I thought I was going to find connection, but actually I feel more alone now than I did yesterday. And so she's grappling with the paradox of, you know, I, we had this intimate moment and yet why do I feel more alienated than ever? You know, what, what is going on here? Uh, and it's you know something that I think a lot of us deal with early in our life as we begin to navigate adult relationships. And then when it comes to her and Ellery, and they have that moment where they finally have that first kiss, and we can probably intuit what's going to follow. Well, I felt like any moment after that, I, I would feel like a voyeur. I'm like, any moment I feel like if, I, if telling the moment makes me feel like a voyeur, then it's going to feel skanky to a reader. I said, mm-hmm. any moment that even hints of voyeurism, out the airlock. Bye-bye. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I want to tell a love story, but that's it. I, I don't want to intrude on their privacy. I want their privacy to be theirs. Yeah. So those were sort of the pitfalls I, I kept in mind. And I did play with one of them near the end of the book where I'm like, the gay readers are going to think, Mac, you promised us no barrier gays. You lied to me, didn't you? You're about to. And then I... You know, spoiler alert, there'll be the twist moment, and then you're going to go, you didn't lie to me. Mm -hmm. All right. There we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. (laughs) My favorite moment of all that was at the very end. I don't know how you feel about it, Jesse, but one of my favorite lines in the whole book is when Seven finally has Kogish on the floor, and he's trapped in, you know, a, a trap of his own making that's been sort of, you know, turned on him. And she basically just has to tell him, you know, I will never again be shamed for being who and what I am. And I will never let anyone tell me I don't know my own name. I loved that moment. And I I very much got the very overt queer trans vibes at that exact at that exact beat. And I was going to keck. I was I felt it because, again, it goes back to connecting to um, that bit where you, the Federation doesn't recognize her because of her name change. Right. And again, it goes to a lot of things that trans people have to deal with, too, of, oh, because our name on our documents doesn't match up, we exactly. don't get recognized or we have to be... there's Can't always get through a an pain airport. In the ass. Yeah, exactly. Have trouble opening a bank account. Exactly. So at that moment, was like, tell me I don't know my own name was a fantastic uh, beat. And, and echoes, too, uh, what happens in Picard season three with Shaw, where she's also put into another stage of transition in her life, joining Starfleet mm-hmm. and being like, do I fit mm-hmm. here uh, now? And then facing that same stigma that she was facing that you bring up in this novel. So of course, I, that was I think what's different there, obviously, I think Shaw is even aware that he's dead naming her and he knows that he's being mm-hmm. a dick by doing it. But he's dealing with his repressed own trauma, trauma uh, you know, Wolf 359 mm-hmm. and her connection to the Borg 
which is what's triggering him. And he's just never dealt honestly with his own pain. He probably did not go to the Starfleet mandated counseling sessions that he was supposed <laughs> to. And somehow yeah. it slipped through the cracks and he got away with it. Uh, but he really needed to go to those sessions. And he should. I was, the, you just gave me a thought. Is there like the uh, the like Starfleet uh, corporate videos that people have to watch? Like, all right, everybody, <laughs> time to watch the 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 ex Borg, uh, the ex B like corporate training video. How do you address ex Borg's name? Don't stare at their cybernetic implants. <laughs> okay, it's uh, pronoun training day here. At Starfleet. Exactly. I mean, we're going to be starting with the Andorians. They've got four genders. This gets a little confusing, so try to keep up. There will be a mm-hmm. test. Now, if they're in this type of relationship, here's all these these pronouns. Yeah, that. <laughs> gosh, the the HR department for Starfleet must be. <laughs> what is the proper way to ask out a trill who has switched genders since you last knew them? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is don't. It's a taboo in their society. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That would oh. that would be very fun. <laughs> oh my god! That's HR awesome. training at Starfleet Academy intake. That would that would that's a that's, that's that's a comedy film waiting to be made. That really is. <laughs> I would love to make that one day. <laughs> Not to plant a bug in your ear, but I see a collab with you and Steve Shives, and the it like I feel like that would be perfect. <laughs> that would actually that. be wonderful. He and I should do that with an HR. His uh his uh what is it like the union rep Starfleet videos that he yes. did and that those were fun. Yeah, I love those. He's <laughs> he's killing it with those. So I sh- I should reach out to him. That would be a fun video to do. <laughs> well, we briefly you briefly mentioned the framing story, which I want to address. And and the story starts out with Seven of Nine meeting this stranger in a bar on Fenris. On Fenris, yes, mm-hmm. and um. Mm-hmm. I uh, <laughs> I was sad that I had I actually recently rewatched season one, so there was the brief mention of like a tattoo on the temple, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is yeah. this this is isn't it? And then of course you have to wait till the very end, but yes, it is in fact Bejazel, and it's the beginning of of her worming her way into Seven of Nine's life, and the beginning of the resultant havoc that that uh, mm. creates. Uh, I'm curious what what led you to kind of use that as the framing story and, and her part in Seven's life going forward. The principal reason to have the framing sequence was that if we were just to do the story that's set in 2380, 2381 and leave it at that, uh, as satisfying as that might have been as a story, we wouldn't have felt comfortable marketing that as a Star Trek Picard mm. novel. Because uh, mm, although it tells a backstory event that is clearly related to and based on Picard, person who has watched Picard and picks up that book would feel like I don't recognize any of the stuff in this book as being what I saw in Picard. Nothing I saw in Picard seems to have anything to do with the content of this book aside from backstory. Whereas with the framing sequence, even though it's set still... 14, 15 years, 13 to 15 years before Picard seasons one through three, it is a scene at least that we remember her telling the story. And it's seven now in her full kind of ranger incarnation. She's like fully ranger now. Uh, Maybe still not quite as paranoid as she ought to be because she still has not suffered the great tragedy of her life yet. She hasn't lost her son Echeb yet. And, but we recognize her. This is, you know, the, the Ranger you see, Ranger 7, with the beginnings of her alcoholism problem, you know, beginning uh, with the whiskey as she's sitting at the bar. Um, this is, you say, yeah, yeah, that that's the 7 I remember seeing in Picard Season 1. There she is. How does she get this way? Well, she's telling the story. And she's telling the story to this stranger who has, you know, expressed a desire to join the Rangers, which, according to what she said in Season 1, is exactly how Bejazel approached her. Woman came up to me in a bar, said she wanted to be a ranger. She basically gave us the story right there. And then the whole thing is, when you get to that last chapter, and she's sort of doing the wrap-up, and there's the mention of, you know, she's saying, well, what happened? She's like, well, you know, the the battle on Zerat, you know, the, the Omicron pulse, you know, permanently knocked out my my, my Borg dandaprobes and my, my, you know, whatever, my implants. You know, they're basically inert now. They're useless. This is a lie. She lies on purpose. She's learned to lie to protect herself. She gets careless. She knows to protect herself. She forgets to lie to protect Echeb. And she mm-hmm. unwittingly puts a target on Echeb the moment 
she starts talking about him and his capabilities and how wonderful he is and yada yada yada. You might as well have just kill him yourself because now Bejazel knows ex Borg. She's got a name. She's got somebody to look for. She can now start putting the bounty out. And it's not long after that that she kills Ichab. Ichab is at that point in Starfleet. He is a serving officer. And it's while he's you know on an assignment cooperating with the Rangers, probably through something that Seven set up, that he stumbles into this trap and winds up getting butchered by Bejazel. Uh, the whole flashback sequence that we saw in season one uh, of Picard. So this is right around that time. This is imme- basically at most maybe a few months at most before that tragedy happens. This is the conversation that will set in motion the greatest tragedy of Seven's life. And I felt like, you know, in terms of you know bookending a story, if you're going to bookend a story with anything, bookend it with something that's just as meaningful as the stuff inside. Hmm. And it gives it gives a trajectory too of again just where her kind of arc goes into Picard and then where she even goes into all the way through that series as well of like you see her leaving Starfleet and then finding her self identity and then that also still being a place of transition. So I liked that that like full circle of like life's always a transition between many phases um, that you get with that. So we're always going through changes, mm-hmm. and the universe does too. So. Yeah. yeah. Change is the essential nature of everything until it runs out of heat and entropy takes over. That's going to suck. <laughs> Fortunately, we're not going to be here for that. Well, speak for yourself. I plan to live forever. Good luck with that one. I don't think you're going to enjoy entropy one bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, my only thought about death is, you know, the, the great irony of oblivion is you don't know it when you don't see it. Mm-hmm. Mm. For me, I do have to say that, like, some of the most memorable things for me when I'm reading a book are those moments when you're reading and and especially rereading something and you're screaming at the characters to make a different choice. Mm -hmm. And that moment at the end, at the very end of of the bookend of this, where she's talking to Bejazel and getting closer. I'm screaming at seven. Get out of there. Don't buy her another drink. Get out of there. Exactly. Mm. What are you doing? And that will stick with me. Like that definitely yeah, it's, it's something that it's one of, it, yeah, it's meant to be that moment where, you know, just like her, this will be a moment that she's that is going to haunt her for the rest of her life. She's gonna realize that's the moment I got my son killed. And it's also too it, it speaks to one of the other you were talking about pitfalls of um uh straight writers often they with queer characters. And what I did really like about this story, and with Bajazel sort of fitting into that, it's sort of alluded to in Picard, they're never explicitly stated, um, is that you get a, a range of queer relationships here too. With the like the sort of more frivolous one that you talked about too with the Andorian, and then you get a more actual deep emotional love story, and then you get kind of an abusive exploitative one with Bajazel that is hinted at. And so it's 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 often very easy to idolize queer relationships in in stories, especially those by even well meaning straight writers. And so this was like a nice uh range of like here's you know queer people's relationships are just as can be just as beautiful and just as messed up as as straight people's relationships and i did like that panoply of relationships that we get here thank you i also wanted to make sure that there were characters who were just part of the universe like uh deputy chief yiv uh Mm -hmm. who was described as being intersex and it's just that's just a fact of their existence and it's there and we move on uh we have lieutenant darusha the aide to uh, Admiral Janeway, who is described essentially with non-binary pronouns, a non-binary individual. And again, Mm -hmm. it's simply there. Uh, It is acknowledged. Yes, here it is. And then nothing more need be said because it is a normal part of the landscape. Here it is. Yes, we acknowledge. This is what it is. And we move on. It's what I've loved about the novels so much. I mean, the shows have been doing it pretty well, too. But even then, there's also even there's it also has to fit into the apparatus of like Picard. There was like a non-binary and and I'm glad for that. And it's important to celebrate that, too. But it's always sort of like the there's always that little bit of like, hey, we're celebrating. Look, we have the non-binary characters. Like, I also just like it being like, yeah, there's just a character that happens to be there that's non-binary. We're never going to draw attention to it. Um, which I, which it's again, there's all things for their own way, but I, I, I always appreciate seeing that in a novel of just like, Hey, yeah, it's non-binary character. No, 
no bigger deal to it. So one last thing that I kind of wanted to bring up was uh, the audiobook version of this. And uh, Jesse, that's how you. That's read how this I listened to right? it. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. So, um, what was that experience like? I know all of the Star Trek novels lately have been getting this audiobook treatment. Um, I personally haven't experienced that myself, but January Lavoie, I know, has been getting some uh, rave reviews online for uh, her narration of this book. Uh, what was that experience like? I loved it. I mean, Jennifer, uh, both her and um, I'm blanking on the um, the gentleman who does the the sort of male focused Robert uh, Petkoff. Books, Robert mm. Petkoff. Both of them are fantastic, but Jennifer. Like she did, she, her Janeway is spot on. Like it is a perfect Janeway impression. Um, And then everyone else was also really, really great too. And she just does a great job sort of capturing the essence of each character so that, you know, she's not doing uh, like her seven um, is not exactly Jerry Ryan, but you can still get the essence of that character's defiance and, and also like her stiltedness towards the beginning and then her opening up towards later on. That's what I really love in a good audio narrators they are able to um like capture the essence of a character while not being too distracting from from the audiobook because you know they're there to read the book as opposed to like uh it being like an audio drama for example right so i i think that that's a a really good skill and she does a great job um and then also shout out to robert petkoff who also does great too his his i will say robert petkoff and vulcan characters are always phenomenal whenever he reads his vulcans are fantastic so I guess, David, from your perspective, is there anything different that goes into when you know it's going to be uh, an audiobook or anything like that? Or I mean, over the last few years, audiobooks have become sort of standard operating practice for the track mm-hmm. novel. Going back now at least six years, maybe more. I, I can't really remember when it became just something that we could count on happening with all the books uh, in a given cycle. In the years since that has become de rigueur, I have modified my writing style a little bit to the point where I used to use, you know, noun markers like said, he said, she said, whatever, uh, very sparingly. Now I try to use them not at all. Mm-hmm. I have tried to adopt a, ta- a technique, a style that indicates a shift in speaker by incorporating maybe uh, mentioning somebody's mood, a shift in expression, uh, doing something that cues the reader to understand our focus is now on this character and then immediately attaching their line of dialogue to whatever that bit of description is so that as a result when you're listening to the audiobook and the uh, the audio reader the narrator is able to go through they know that they have to shift to that voice and they can read the dialogue and then come out of the dialogue back into pure exposition without the clumsiness of having to read the words he said because i felt like he said although it is invisible they say you know when you're reading it in printed prose when i was listening to it in audio format i it made me just sort of bristle every time every time i heard it i i felt like it was jumping out at me like in an audio format it's not invisible there is nothing invisible right. in audio format. Every word that's read registers. So it doesn't just slip by the way it does when your eye is scanning the page and you know to just skim over he said, she said. So because I was aware of this particular uh, fact about audiobooks over the last several years, if you look, you'll see there was a shift probably going anywhere from six to eight years ago. You'll see the shift happen in my prose where I just begin to jettison almost all use of dialogue markers. I just jettison them to the point where I don't even use them anymore for the most part. It's interesting too, because I notice I, I do a lot of, for my own work, because I do YouTube stuff, like I'll, I write all my videos, but then I'll be, I'll, and I'll read them and it's like, oh, this looks great. And then I will say them out loud and I'll be like, oh man, this feels awkward to say, because as you read them, it'll be like, oh, I can have this long sentence. It makes sense. There's a lot of, um, you know, they all connect very well. But when you say them, it feels very ma- mash. Bleh. I can't say li- it's I'm doing right now with my sentences. I'm very articulate. <laughs> uh, it, it just sort of like runs all together and it doesn't complete an idea and it sort of becomes noise. So it's interesting to hear uh, other authors like discuss what's the difference between having just written it and then hearing it read aloud. So Yeah. One of the things I do during the editing process is read the book out loud to myself while I'm working on it. 
I find that that often helps me find missing words, uh, omitted words. Uh, it also helps me find homonyms that I've messed up. Things jump out at me more clearly when I'm reading the book out loud. The other thing I find when I read it out loud is if a sentence just doesn't roll off the tongue, if it doesn't work, if it's clumsy, if there are two words that have been placed together, which while they look fine in print, when you try to speak them, your tongue just does not navigate well and it causes the reader to stumble verbally. When I find those, I, I try to take them out and rewrite them into something that flows more lyrically. And I try to be aware of the musicality of text, the rhythm, the pace. Does the sentence, you know, do sentences get shorter as the action gets faster? Do I hit hard enough? Does it make the right point? If I'm going to have a long, eloquent sentence, do I at least find a, a variety of different words? Do I find uh, that there's a nice sort of assonance to it? Do I work in a little sort of subtle rhyme before I wrap it up? I look for ways in which the music of the language can come through. And I also look for the traps where it doesn't work. Reading it out loud uh, as part of the editing process helps with that. I'm reminded of every time I put the phrase edited it into one of my YouTube scripts. I'm like, no, nope, can't do that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Awesome. No, that's a really cool insight. And I, I never thought of that shift as the, as the audiobook thing comes in. That's really cool. I guess to wrap up, I just have to say, I absolutely love this novel. I, I think it speaks to a lot of really great things. And again, just going back to that desire to see that backstory, you know, four years ago now i can't believe it's been that long but uh to finally see the the start of that i can't imagine that it'll you know light the same kind of fire like i said that it would for you know a pike series or star trek legacy but like come on give us a, a fenris rangers limited run even just showing us stuff that's centered not just on starfleet and stuff i i loved it just for that too well thank you i enjoyed doing it obviously uh, i don't know that i want to do another fenris rangers book but if they came to me and said hey this thing sold really well we want you to write another i'm not a fool i'll say yes i'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> well, find a reason i'll find a story worth telling um, but I think what really intrigued me about this one is that it's a standalone and very often over the last 20 years, we were doing all this interconnected continuity. So to get back to sort of the old classic way of the Star Trek novels, the way they were back in like the eighties and the nineties, where each one was this standalone event, this experience, uh, and to have it be the coming of age story for seven, a beloved character. That was just a really exciting project to take on. But for me, the most harrowing part was just waiting to find out whether or not queer and trans readers felt like I accomplished my mission. Did I achieve representation with respect and authenticity? Uh, and and did, it, did it work as a story for them? And that's my hope is that I wanted there to be good representation in a Star Trek story so that everybody, you know, especially people who feel like maybe they have not been well represented uh, in the past, can see themselves as part of Star Trek's bright future and say, see, I belong there too. There's me. I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, what I will say is the the queer aspect of it, the literal queer aspect of it, I really love and I thought you captured very well. And the trans metaphor that Seven fits within also works very, very well. And again, that moment um, of like, say, like, know my damn name, I thought was a great sort of, like not even just a like, haha! Look at the trans metaphor. There it is. It was a great triumphant moment for her character and fit her arc. And oftentimes, when I see those types of stories, it usually will be like, hey, look, we are doing the trans metaphor now. Whereas here, is it felt just a natural outgrowth of the story that you were telling that is very queer in its in its ethos, but wasn't very much like pointing and saying, look, we're doing we're doing the queer stuff now. So I I thought you did a really excellent job from my perspective. So. Mm. Thank you. It means a lot. Well, I guess all that's left is to ask uh, what you have on the go, what you can talk about, can't talk about, uh, Star Trek or otherwise, uh, that our listeners would be interested in. Well, let's see. Uh, don't have any novels currently under contract, unfortunately. I have a, an original that I'm tinkering with, but it's not ready to go out into the world to look for a home yet. Uh, I have four Star Trek short stories coming up over the course of this year in Star Trek Explorer magazine. 
Uh, and that's going to be in four consecutive issues, 11, 12, 13, and 14. The one in 11 I know will be in the print edition. The others might be in the print or they might be in the digital supplement. So uh, you might want to subscribe now so you don't miss anything. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very happy with those four short stories. They were fun to write. They're, um, I'd like to say they're all very different, but actually the first three are all in some way ruminations on death and grief and loss. Uh, and then the fourth one is just an ass kicking action story. Uh, <laughs> so I had some fun with that. I have two, all the best parts of David Mack there, honestly. Lots of grief, death, and, and, and introspection, followed by somebody getting their ass handed to them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that's me. That's how life should go. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got two original short stories coming out in themed anthologies. Uh, one is coming out in November, and the other, I think, is scheduled for the fall, but I don't have a firm date for that yet. One is from Bain, and that's going to be The Last Train to Kepler 283C. Space Western is the theme of the anthology. Uh, and my story in that one is called Living by the Sword. And it's basically a young girl dreams of adventure until an encounter with an old female gunfighter encourages her to take a different path in life. And then the other story is part of an anthology called Combat Monsters, edited by Henry Hertz. And that anthology is basically real battles of World War II reimagined if they involve supernatural creatures, monsters, creatures out of myth, uh, whatever. Uh, so my story is called Boxcar, B-O-C-K-S-C-A-R, which is the name of the real-life aircraft that dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. You can imagine what kind of monster they're going to face. So that's what I have turn, coming out in terms of fiction. In nonfiction, coming around the end of April... There is a book called Strange Novel Worlds, Essays on Star Trek Fiction. It has an essay by me. I'm actually the, the first one in the book uh, called Official But Not Canon. And it's basically about writing Star Trek tie-ins as a professional and how what I need to know about things like canon, continuity, uh, and how these terms are not necessarily synonymous. Um, there's also an essay in there by Una McCormick. Uh, and essays by a number of other tremendous fan writers. Uh, so it's basically a deep dive look into different aspects of Star Trek fiction. Uh, most of it, the official published fiction. There may be some essays on fan fiction. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have to have another look at the TOC. But that's What's that one called. It's called Strange Novel Worlds, and it's coming from McFarland Books. They publish mostly academic books. Uh, of which this is an academic book. It's a, a work of academic essays. So it's my, my first time doing academic writing since college. So it's been about 30 years. But there it is. And that's coming out in April. It's not a cheap book, but by academic book standards, it is pretty affordable. It's like 55, I think, is the cover I price. just pre-ordered it while you were talking. It is $55 <laughs> and it's coming out on April 29th. So there you go. Nice. <laughs> oh, there you go. So that's what I have <laughs> in the pipeline that I know of. Uh, I'm currently working on a top secret scripting gig that I can't really talk about because I don't know what the final credits on it are going to be and whether my contribution is going to be anonymous or not. So I'll find that out in a few months and I'm hoping to get another Trek book one of these years. We'll see. Fingers Excellent. Really well, we'll definitely of course be reading it. So <laughs> one can only hope. awesome. And if people want to follow you or catch up on what you've got coming up, uh, where can they do that? Well, you can rely on me to have my bibliography updated on my official website, davidmack.pro. That's David Mac, M A C K dot P R O. You can find me on Blue Sky at David Mac, all one word, lowercase. I'm also on Facebook. I have an author page at facebook.com slash the David Mac. And there are others besides that, but those are the ones I principally use. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, Jesse, thank you so much for co-hosting. Yes, I thank really, you for having really me. appreciate you and and the perspective you bring and having you on the show as always. Uh, why don't you take some time here and and share with the, our listeners what you've got going on because you've got a lot <laughs> going on right now, and I'm really excited about all of it. Well, that's my, uh, well, I'll, where you can follow me for the most part is uh, Jesse Gender on YouTube. That's where my video essay style stuff is. Uh, I have a lot of video essays on Star Trek for all y'all. And then you can follow me on Twitter and Blue Sky are the main ones, Jesse Gender as well. But yeah, the what you're alluding to is I'm working on a 
uh, science fiction film um, starring John Delancey is going to be in it, uh, and he was amazing. Uh, I actually have a voiceover recording session with him next Friday, so I'm, I'm going to be talking with him, and he's literally the sweetest and one of the nicest people. He's been super wonderful about... Uh, speaking of like queer and trans stuff, like our set was super queer and super trans we had trans flags everywhere and and we had pronoun buttons all over the set and he came in and he was just like oh and he was super kind and got everyone's pronouns right off the bat and he was like super like on it and just excited to be there so like just uh, like he very easily could have been just like i'm here i'm gonna do it my day and get out of here but he was super kind so he's wonderful and the rest of the movie is uh super queer super trans we have a um john delancey is the only cis straight white dude on the whole cast and i i share him because he's the star trek person but uh abigail thorne of philosophy tube and uh uh, Jackie Cox, um, who everyone knows from RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, uh, so, like, Jessica Nicole from Fringe. So, I'm very pumped about it. It'll be coming out later this year. I know the uh, official, what the planned official release date is, but uh, I can't say just yet. Um, and uh, But it'll be coming in just a few short months, hopefully, for everybody over on Nebula. So, that'll be, that's the streaming service that's uh, funding it. So, I am very pumped about it. So, thank you for Thank you for indulging me sharing uh, all that, but it's uh, it's going to be fun. So. Oh, of course. Yeah. No, I'm excited too. It's It looks to be really cool. I, I can't wait. And I, every time you bring it up, I keep forgetting like Jessica Nicole. I love her. Mm-hmm. Love her. There's so many awesome people. She's every, everyone I was, I was, you know, for a first project, everyone on this film was just the absolute sweetest. I guess and like most of our cast and crew was all, like I said, queer, trans and, and women. Um, so it was, it was just a very queer set that everyone was just having fun on and, and the vibes were always very nice so i i was i was very lucky just by everyone in the cast and crew just being kick-ass so awesome well i'll definitely have a link to all of that in the uh show notes for this as well so go check that out if you haven't yet that would be awesome (laughs) yeah well thanks again so much this has been great uh we will see you next time on the next positively trek until then as always stay positive Positively Trek is produced and edited by me, Dan Gunther, and co-produced by Barry DeFord on Treaty 8 Territory, the home of the Beaver, Cree, Dene, and Métis people, whose histories, languages, and cultures we respect. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations.